So thank you for this opportunity to speak. I'd like to start by just making a, a small announcement that Amplitude uh, 2021 has finally been uh, assigned dates and it'll be hosted at the Nils Bohr International Academy in Copenhagen. Uh, and uh, we plan the school around the 9th to the 13th, 21, and the conference from 16 to 20th. And the organizing committee are all these well-known names, including Jacob Borgeli, Paul Damgo, Michelle Levy, Andrew McLeod, Matt von Hebel, Christian Vergo, and Matthias Wilhelm. So sorry for the confusion, but because of the corona, we had to shift the times a couple of times. And I should mention that the Amplitude 2021 will be supported by the SADIX network, as well as the Nils Bohr Institute. So now from this announcement to my talk. So my talk is titled Einstein Gravity from Scattering Amplitudes. And I'd like to sort of present um, a bit about the work I've been doing with a number of people. So Andrea Christofoli, Paul Damgo, and also work with John Donahue, Guido Festuccia, Humberto Gomez, um, Barry Holstein, Ludovic Plante, and Pierre van Hoog. And again, this uh, research we do are supported by the SADIX network. So general relativity can uh, be described as a perturbative effective uh, field theory. And we'll start with that viewpoint and discuss somehow how we can use this framework to work with uh, general relativity in a perturbative way. And what is a new feature we have heard in today's talks um, a lot about this, that we can use an, a number of on-shell techniques in order to compute stuff in general relativity. And there's a number of new applications that uh, among other things, we can compute several types of observables. And in the end, I'll focus on some of the work we have been doing on scattering angles and using the specific energy relation and make a small outlook. So we have many exciting motivations to study gravity. So um, we have just oh, a few years back seen the first direct observation of binary matches of black holes. And that means that now we have access to gravitational interaction. We have access to data in these regimes of gravity that are very extreme. And here we have a number of um, obstacles for analysis basically that if we do an, a normal numerical brute force analysis, there are certain regions that are becoming hard to, to reach. And then we can use some of these results and amplitudes to catch up. And another interesting feature, I think personally, is to develop somehow gravity phenomenology. And here, for instance, we can talk about higher spins or higher derivative terms in an effective action. What is maybe a surprise um, is that we can use um, this relativistic and quantized theory of gravity, really sort of a quantum gravity theory and extract classical physics from that. And this seems to be more efficient than actually solving Einstein fields equations. It's definitely a different computational framework. So we are solving things like uh, we do in, in amplitudes where we solve for scattering amplitudes, and then we identify certain classical pieces. And I'll explain why it is that there are classical pieces in these amplitudes. And we will also hear today many talks on this topic. Um, there'll be Julio, we'll hear from Michelle about the progress for spins, as well as Radu, and we'll also hear Chen. Chen. So one key question that um, at least has been sort of uh, revolving in the last uh, period of time, is if we can de define some way of extracting precise uh, classical physics from unshell amplitudes. And we should do that with the least amount of work. So I'll explain some of the, the current things that are being done. And the goal of all this is of course, to increase the potential of, of new physics, because if we have a better breakdown of what we see in, in the gravitational mergers, we also have a more uh, accurate gravitational wave analysis. So the starting point is really treating uh, general relativity as a quantum field theory. 
So it has been known for quite some time that we can do a particle version of general relativity. So that shouldn't be a, a big surprise. So what we start with is to take the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian that was formulated by Einstein and we expand around a perturbation field. So we take a, a flat metric and we expand with a quantum field around it. And then we expand this uh, Lagrangian out. We can put in matter interactions as well, both minimal and, and non-minimal interactions. And then we can derive vertices in this theory. And we can basically continue to do computation just using Feynman diagrams. So that means we take a viewpoint, gravity is really like a non-appealing gates field theory and we have self-interactions. And the history uh, is like this, that is, is first shown by Toft and Veltman that this theory is, is non-renormalizable and it is non-renormalizable because it comes with a dimensionful coupling. And for many years, it was not really taken serious because it was really believed that there's no symmetry that can remove the UV divergences and we have to either consider string theory or something else. So the whole situation of using this viewpoint to do computation was resolved by Weinberg. So basically he took this viewpoint that we just see general relativity in this formulation. So the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian as a Lagrangian that has infinitely many higher derivative operators. So we start with the minimal Einstein-Hilbert action, but we develop a version that includes high derivative terms. That means we can absorb all the UV divergences that we have in the, in the, in, in the starting action. So we, had, we don't really have that problem that we don't have uh, renormalizability of the theory but we have introduced a number of constants, all the C1 to C infinity, and all these constants in principle have to absorb UV divergences as we go along. So we lose some predictability, but there's, of course, if we go to a specific string theory, we can look at specific effective actions. So this is the point of view of, of all these computations that we have a consistent quantum theory and this was basically put forward by, by Donahue back in uh, 93. So this is like a quantum gravity theory at low energies. And we have a direct connection to low energy dynamics of string and supergravity theories. So basically what it su suggests is that we take Einstein's theory, but we have argumented it by higher derivative operators. And this should somehow be considered the most general modified theory. So now this question of extracting classical physics from this theory. So this question was actually first really done by, um, I mean, it's been done by many people, but there's a famous paper, paper by Iwasaki and it was then followed later by people like uh, Donahue and, and Holstein and, and, and also there's a recent paper by Kosovo and, and O'Connell. So the idea is that we can take this quantum theory that we have just quantized, and then we can try to, to take a classical limit where we basically take h bar to zero. And it turns out there's an interesting feature in gravity that loop diagrams contain classical physics, and we need to find ways to extract the classical physics from these loop diagrams. And furthermore, in order to make context to a theory like Einstein's theory or general relativity, we have to take care. So we can't just take the amplitudes and, and say, now we know what is somehow um, an observable in general relativity. We have to work out somehow how we map from the amplitude into the general relativity. And we are learning that. So the starting point for me getting into to gravity was this one loop computation that was initiated by John and that was completed in a paper in 2001 where we computed the full one loop amplitude using total off-shell diagram. So the starting diagram is the, the tree amplitude in which you have two massive sources that it interchanges a, a graviton. And then you develop the loop diagrams. You have so-called boxes, you have triangle contributions, and you have bubbles. And you also in this framework has ghost terms and other pieces. And there's a lot of things we don't include in this because we don't include, for instance, graviton legs on the external sides like this. So the idea behind this was to, to generate sort of a, a 
to understand the general form of the one loop amplitude. And it can be written down in the following way. So one gets some polynomial terms that are all associated to, to very short range behavior of the theory. And then one develops some coefficients that one see immediately have um, long range behavior. And the interesting thing is that we can actually derive both beta one and beta two without considering the high derivative terms. So this theory is actually consistent without including very much of the high derivatives. Of course, as we progress into the, to, to um, uh, high orders in perturbation theory, this statement can change. But, um, but one lesson we learned is that we, we don't have to necessarily compute the full amplitude as long as we understand how to derive the long distance behavior. That, these are the pieces that we can naturally observe. And only and for most applications, these are the ones we need. And also we can generate from this theory, which is a new thing, which is not in general relativity, unique quantum terms. And they are sort of part of this effective field theory description. So what we consider this one loop, and now with current state of the art, we can probably probe even higher loops. And the third lesson was this interesting feature that there's classical contributions that arise from loop diagrams. So we see here beta two comes like a one over Q. And that terms, if we look at it dimensionally, has to scale as an H bar to the zero, while the log we see here has an H bar. So the beta one is associated with something quantum, while beta two is a classical contribution. And this feature that gravity has, so, so to speak, classical contributions in the loop diagrams, it continues to all perturbative orders. So at higher loop orders, we have to find the terms that gives us classical contributions. And it's, it's basically a consequence of general relativity being a nonlinear theory. So the final result for the amplitude we computed is the result that we get Newton's law as we should. We get a post-Newtonian term and we get a quantum correction, which is unique. And we were of course happy to see that we could find agreement with uh, the literature. So one way to, to see that for instance, the, the classical contribution worked is that one has to work out a certain scheme that we know from uh, quantum mechanics the born subtractions. So what we have to do to leading order is just to, to relate the matrix element of the amplitude to a potential. So to linear order, the potential and the matrix element of the amplitude is basically just uh, the same. But if we develop this formalism to higher orders, we have to actually expand out the series where we basically have sort of an energy perturbation. And when we do that, we have to compute these integrals that sit in this term. And if we do that precisely, we see that the amplitude gives us the first term, but we can make contact with the einstein infel hoffman hamiltonian by including the second term. And if we work it out, it becomes something like seven and a half. And it's very lucky to see that the three we had before minus the seven and a half gives us exactly the minus one half we see here. So from that perspective, we can see that we can make contacts to, to post-Newtonian physics. So this is um, somehow a, a, a generic framework for, for working with gravity effective uh, as an effective field theory is that we can just treat it as an effective field theory and thereby we uh, avoid many of the confusions and we have a, a, quantize, a, a framework we can quantize. And Basically, if we find a more fundamental theory, we will be able to find an effective action that is related to that. So this is not you know, a bad framework we, to work with if we want to quantize gravity. And classical GR, this uh, effective field theory has a huge validity. It's basically valid up to the Planck scale. So that means we can, we can use this for all these treatments we want at least at least many of the of the treatments that did a theoretical analysis for black hole mergers. So now comes um, somehow the connections to, to amplitudes. 
So what we did in, in the original paper with John and, and, and Barry Holstein was to expand the Lagrangian, and that's quite hard because you have to expand all the curvature terms. Then you have to build vertices, and then you have to work with off-shell expressions. So this is the three-point vertex. This is related to, well, or corresponds to what David and Sanon found. And it's clearly much more complicated Yang -Mills, than Yang-Mills theory. There's still some useful applications once we move away from uh, things that can be computed from on-shell diagrams. So beyond having these vertices, we have contractions. We have all the normal features we have in amplitudes like factorial growth and many different Feynman diagram topologies we have to sum over. There's a number of, of symmetry factors. There's different gauges we can pick. If we do loops, we have to work out ghost terms. And then we get much more involved tensor loop integrals than we do in, in QCD. So the last piece here we will also face in the on shell amplitudes, but many of these things here can be eliminated if we look at it from an amplitude point of view. So in, for instance, spinner helicity, we can go into the, to the vertices and we can see how gravity simplifies things. So by imposing spinner helicity in the vertex, we can see that many of the terms just disappear. We can use these gravity um, polarization vectors that we know from of QCD. And basically the three-point vertex just become one term. So in a few years back, um, we deci I decided together with John Donahue and Van Hove to look at the first one loop um, application of, of how to rederive basically the original computation that I did with, with John and Barry. So if we look at the one loop cut, we can treat it the same way as we do for a, a normal cut. So we have two massive legs and a tree, and then we have a cut di um, graviton line. And if we look at the imaginary part of such amplitudes, we know that we can relate that to the cut. And here in this kind of formalism, we can use KLT. We can use that, for instance, three point vertices square and they are, if we use an on-shell formalism, we can just work out somehow um, the, the trees we need here. And um, there's many different ways we can, we can compute. One of the, one feature that, that is very nice is that if we do it with spinner helicity variables, we avoid the question of ghosts, but this is somehow depending on, on which on-shell formalism you use, um, if you have ghosts or not. So when we look at massive scaling, uh, so, so let's take an example. So this is basically what we did. We worked out a Lagrangian. So we have the Einstein-Hilbert term. We have uh, a coupling to uh, a massive scalar. And then in principle, we should add a number of effective Lagrangian terms here, but we don't need that for this treatment. So if you write down an amplitude with one incoming scalar leg P1 going out P2, and we consider this process, we can associate with, um, with this computation, different vectors. And then we can work out the, the tree level. So if we do that, we get the, the, the following form for the amplitude, we get three terms, and we can directly see that we get the Newton's law through this. And if we work out um, from, uh, KLT, the unitarity cut, we can see that we can use KLT to build up the amplitude. So basically, when you write down the, the simple KLT form, um, one of, of the features we have when we introduce masses is that we have to consider dot products instead of the, the squared Mandelstam variables. And there's actually a nice feature for that. We can look at, the, at, at massive KLT scaling, uh, squaring from um, relations such as this, where we have written something called the S kernel that has an object that actually appears in, in string theory. And we can see that the outer legs here, leg one and N, we can treat as massive, while all the other legs are, are like gravitons. So we can use the same KLC kernels in order to, to build these cuts. So now we can put the unitarity cut together. So 
what we get from a cut like this is um, like we do for QCD, we get something we call the singlet contribution. So we have some gravity crossing the line uh, with say plus helicity here and minus helicity. And then we can have non-singlet where we, we mix. And this follows exactly the uh, BDDK paper from um, uh, the famous BB, uh, BDDK paper. And then we can write out the, the trace form like this and expand. And we see that basically we, what we get from that is when we expand the traces, we can reduce to a scalar basis of integral and we can isolate coefficients. And this is basically the way that, that one can work out these cuts. There's also uh, ways to work out the cuts. We can, we can look at uh, Kajasa and Guevara came up with an, a different way which uses direct spin integration. And you can see in the recent paper by Byrne, Chung, Ryburn, Shen, Sholen, and, and Seng, that they use generalized unitarity. So we have many different ways we can, we can work with this. So once we have worked out, in this case, we, our example is, is like the one loop amplitude, we get a decomposition of coefficients times integrals in a form like this with some prefactor. And now, if we want to make contact to basically to general relativity, we have to make contact to uh, a potential. So the amplitude at one loop is, is given in this form like this, and we have different integrals corresponding to a box, to a cross box, and to triangles. So first of all, we have to consider how we get these classical pieces from the loops. So we can understand it the following way, that when we have a propagator term like this one here, so L1 plus P1 squared minus M1 squared, then we see that in the limit where mass is very large, basically it behaves like a, a one, a two M1 L0, which if we write it out and do a, a contour integral, we can see um, reduces the 4D integral we have here to a 3D integral, and that's of the kind that will give us a classical contribution. So at one loop, the classical pieces that we see that comes with no H bar is traditionally associated with these triangle diagrams we have here. It's, it's a bit more complicated when we go up in loops. So if we work out the different coefficients we see here, the, the, the C1s, um, we see that we have um, the following form of, of the amplitude. So we have all these um, results. These are the results for the, for the integrals. And we have C, um, we have box coefficients, cross box coefficient and, and triangle coefficients associated with all these. So now we have to sum up this expression we have here. And we see that we have in the box something which is um, basically singular in, in, in D equals three. And we also have some phase here, which is an imaginary phase. This is basically the, the, the Weinberg phase, which is described in, in, in Weinberg's paper. It, it, uh, um, it will basically make a, 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 a phase that sits outside the, the, the one loop amplitude. And it has to go away when we reconstruct the potential. And the coefficients here, come directly from the cut computation. So if we go back to the, to the cut. So when we have written out the cut and we have reduced and isolated the coefficients, we have all the coefficients C that we see here. So in order to relate to a potential, we um, can try to do something, um, we, to, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do something relate, similar to, to what we did when we looked at the post-Newtonian einstein ilford hoffman potential. So we want to keep things relativistic so we can work in the PM limit of this theory. And in order to relate to a potential, we can um, 
we can ref re refer to so sort of old-fashioned perturbation uh, theory, which is basically time-ordered. And in order to make um, the connection, we have to eliminate certain processes when we, we, we um, are, are talking about the amplitude. Among other things, we don't want to have annihilation diagrams and, and, and certain multiparticle states inside the amplitude. Um, and also, it, we will we'll throw away the, the quantum pieces. So in, in, in some of the original treatments, the quantum pieces were quite important because it shows that we can quantize gravity. But as we now are interested in, in analyzing these uh, events that happens when we have black hole mergers, we are actually interested in the classical pieces and, and any deviations from them. So we want precision data for those things. So we assume that we have classical and we have long distance scattering. So after we have worked out the amplitude and, and summed all the contributions, we get the following expression. So we still have a singularity here. We see this term is imaginary with a, with a factor i here. And we have a piece here that, that comes with a log. So the question is now how to, to relate to, to a classical potential. And there's uh, been a, a proposition for how to, to do that already. So there is a, a paper by Chong, Stolen, and Rothstein that show how we can relate to, to a bound state problem through a, a sort of an EFT procedure that we uh, refer to as, as a matching procedure. And this is the procedure that was also used by Bern, Chong, Ryburn, Shen, Solon, and Seng in their two loop paper. So we define the amplitude um, uh, in a perturbative expansion around flat Minkowski and metric. And the starting point um, of this treatment is, is to look at the Hamiltonian uh, of uh, relativistic uh, Salpeter equation. So we have a Hamiltonian like this and we have this potential D here. So basically we have to go through solving the Lippmann Swinger equation. So in a similar fashion to what we had for, for solving with the Born subtractions, we have to write down, relate the amplitude to a potential through this equation we see here. So we can invert that and relate basically the potential to the amplitude in the following way. So here is the, the, the standard equivalence to the leading order, but when we go up in perturbative orders, we have to work out this integral we see here. And we can, uh, we can use that to define basically a, a post uh, Minkowskian potential this way for this Fourier transform. So once we have worked out this potential here in P and P prime space, we can work out the potential in, in radial coordinates. So we can start with the tree and we can use the matching procedure of the EFT as a guide for basically how this is supposed to work. And we see immediately if we start with the tree, we had the three terms here, that we get the same result from the matching as we do when we work out the Lippmann Swinger. So basically the potential becomes this term here and we can identify the coefficient C1 and uh, with these scaling parameters. At, at one loop, we have to work out the, the iteration. And this is a bit more complicated since we have to put in the, the, the amplitudes and we have to do some expansion. But we see that if we do that um, consistently, uh, that the, the, the result becomes as follows. So we get a term which has uh, three propagator terms and we have one that has two. And this is of course what we want, the, the classical contribution. So from this perspective, we get uh, the, the one loop amplitude that we started with that came from, from the cut and the iterated um, uh, piece that we have to add. And if we add that iterated piece to the one loop, we see that we get a cancellation and that the two things combine in this following way, which is basically the 2 p.m. potential. And again, the same result as the matching procedure uh, described. 
So that means that if we, if we in a systematic way, solve the Lippmann swinger, we can derive the, the, the same potential as we do from doing a post match matching from um, an, uh, an, uh, an EFT uh, treatment. And we see in this potential here that we have no singular term. And here we have the, the triangle contributions. So one of the developments that uh, we worked on uh, uh, is that, um, that in fact, there's an even simpler way than going through this solution of the Lippmann Swinger. And that is to use this specific energy relation that is, is written here. So the energy relation was, was, uh, was noted in, in the Moore's paper here and also by Bern et al. Bian, Chung, Raiban, Xian, Solon, and Seng. But it was really sort of um, put forward in, in these two papers here by uh, Carlin and Porto and our paper. And there's been a, a follow up can paper. I, can I just remind yeah. you, you have, you have half an hour and you have already spoken for half an hour. Just to. Just okay. To I'm, uh, um, I'm almost done. So, um, so if we use this. Uh, if we use this uh, matching procedure, uh, no, no, the energy relation, um, we get a, a very nice result. So basically what we can see is that we can directly solve the, the matching uh, procedure in such a way that we, we get the definition of an effective potential. So we can revert, we can use the, the, the energy relation to define, basically redefine the problem in terms of a non-relativistic Hamiltonian with an effective potential V effective. And through that potential, we can uh, we can solve it in a in a non-relativistic framework in the in the in the normal way we, we can and, and through that we can derive a, a scattering angle formula to all orders. And it's interesting because it 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 creates uh, it 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 basically um, corrects basically sort of previous naive uh, treatments of how to generate uh, uh, light bending. So one of the interesting features is this derivative here and the potential that has a, an expo exponent. So we have to get iterated terms starting from two loop orders in order to get the right scattering angle. And another interesting feature in the formula is we, we don't have a minimal distance uh, scaling. So we worked out this formula that basically confirmed the three and, and four PM results of, of this paper, of, of Burns paper with uh, collaborators. So I'll, I'll skip this in light of time and say that um, that, that it's, uh, the amplitude toolbox for computations have already provided many uh, interesting features of, of these computation. And we can use all these techniques we know from amplitudes like double copy and KLT, like recursion, unitarity, spinahelicity. We've used the CHY formalism to actually generate uh, tree amplitudes in, in D dimensions that can be used in unitarity to, to generate gravity amplitudes. And we can, we can also consider using low energy um, limits of string theory to, to, to do work. There's been a number of impressive 3 p.m. amplitudes computations. There's uh, one today by uh, Paramartinis, Roof and, and Singh that I believe we'll hear about. And also there's endless tasks ahead. We have heard from Justin and we'll hear from Michelle and Radu about spin. We heard from Donald about radiation effects. And there's also quantum terms, inclusion of higher order curvature terms that we can, we can consider in this effective field theory framework. So there's clearly much more physics to learn. So I'll just by this, thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your attention. Okay, very good. Thank you. Here's the applause. Let's see if there are any questions. Yeah, David Broadhurst, please. So my question comes from your reference to Weinberg's work yeah. more than 40 years ago with gravity as an effective field theory. And I remember at that time he suggested that uh, there might not be any fundamental theory, that, that an ultraviolet completion might be provided by uh, um, uh, an ultraviolet stable fixed point. Does yeah. that thinking um, have any place in modern thought? I, I think it does. I mean, there's a whole community focused on this uh, 
for sort of quantum gravity um, treatments of gravity. So there's a something called a, a renormalization group, and there's different takes on how to consider this fixed point. But but it is taken serious. I mean, there's basically two lines of thought of based on Weinberg. Was one was the more practical effective field theory, and and the other one is is this uh, ultraviolet fixed point point of view. And I, I, I believe it's possible to, to even mix the two a bit so, so you can have sort of elements of the effective field theory description also in the randomization group description. Thank you. Okay, Cliff, you had a question? Uh, yeah, um, thanks uh, for the wonderful talk. Um, so okay. it seems clear that the, um, can you hear me? Yeah, so it seems yeah. like it's uh, the impetus formula or this uh, litman ringer is a very like convenient way to do the resummation and to match. But I guess yeah. uh, one question I'd have is at higher p and orders, we can expect kind of more exotic things where the, you know, distinct distinguishing between ultra soft and soft far zone, near zone becomes murky. We have conservative yeah. radiation reaction, hereditary effects, all these things that in EFT, thankfully has been kind of ironed out. Do you, mm -hmm. do you know if there's a way of kind of attaching that to Littman Schwinger so that it can kind of deal with those? Like, is it simple to add radiation? Can, let's say conservative mm -hmm. radiation reaction to that. I mean, it. The, 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 I mean, first of all, I would say that we've only considered basically having a, a conservative scenario, so we haven't really considered having any anything different from that. Um, I but mean, I'm actually I, still talking about radiation. So yeah, there, when we when you have, if you like, just radiation modes which are exchanged but still contribute to the conservative dynamics at, at uh, I guess four pn. Yeah. Can that can that be included in Lippmann Schwinger? Um, it's not something we have considered in, in the formalism. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure, I would say. Um, I mean, I, I think it's possible to, to consider um, deviations from uh, formalism, but um, I, I wouldn't know any obvious way to, to do it in, in this. I mean, th there's a lot of things in the in the treatment that are sort of based on the fact that that it's uh, that one doesn't have sort of radiation effects present. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Andy, you had a question. Andy Strominger, are you there? I am there. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, are there uh, applications being considered for? observational gravitational wave uh, astronomy? Is there some, you know, corner of parameter space in which uh, there's an effect that can be calculated using these techniques that that can't be easily calculated some other way or? I mean, the, the, the idea behind the formalism of computing these PM corrections or spin is to basically develop better and more precise templates for the analysis of say merger events. So there is a direct feed in of basically computations from loop diagrams that give concrete uh, general relativity effects in basically the analysis of merger effects and, and how precise you can determine say masses or, or spin of, of these merging black holes. But there's, but, I, I don't know if there's a like the tidal distortions of the black holes and see it seems very far from this regime. It, I mean, you, you're talking about when you're very near to the merger. Or? Well, when they wanted to match the LIGO waveform to, you know, so, so there's different regimes where you know some regimes it's are very useful. Yeah. So, so some regimes are, are more. Uh, are easily treated by, say, numerical means. But there are certain regimes where these analytic um, contributions or, or, or computations are very needed, actually, for the analysis. Right. And are those regimes they hope to see, or? So those are the regimes that, I mean, from formalisms like this, we hope that we can at least, at least improve the analysis of, like, uh, Thank you. Yeah. All right, Nima, you had a question or comment? I just had a, just a, a, a quick 
general question. Can you point to where all of the like uh, uh, annoying um, uh, radiation reaction issues actually sort of precisely where they where they uh, go away in this way of doing things? I mean, you know, classically you normally well, I mean, depending on what you want to do, you see third order in time equations, blah 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 blah, that 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 kind of stuff. So where where, where does that all get? Uh, of, of course we. We know fundamentally field theory solves those, uh, I mean, quantum field theory solves, solves those problems ultimately, but, uh, but um, uh, it, is, there some, uh, is there some specific spot where you can say that this, this, is, this is what you would classically uh, attribute to a radiation reaction event? I, I mean, I, th I think radiation is, is not uh, something that is very clear at the moment. I mean, what... Uh, what has been the, the focus of, of research has been to basically, if we have uh, conservative amplitudes to relate that to, you know, um, things like amp, uh, p potentials in general relativity and so forth. I mean, I think it's a very interesting field to, to consider if, if we can say something more concrete about radiation. I mean, the, the way it's treated in, in the numerical um, general relativity, I, I understand is, is, a, is a little bit like, um, I mean, there's some element of, of fitting involved. So, so, I so I think. I guess, it, I guess that this this may have been a better question for Donald Stock, but yeah. I was just wondering because uh, there 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 he had the. But but I would still have thought that that I mean that there's a there there's a sort of piece of radiation reaction which is just uh, quantum mechanically just the just the uh, wave function of normalization, right? You know, where you emit and absorb. Uh, and so that, that's 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 what I was asking whether you can. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I think it should be possible to to work out a, a theory for 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 things like that. But I I I think it's there's I mean there's not a, a a very concrete way of doing it at the moment. So maybe I can chime in briefly. Yeah. So I think to add just a for Nima's question. Um, so that that leading order emission is the Burke Thorne radiation, and that's pure imaginary. So that would not enter into these conservative dynamics. But the first leading conservative radiation reaction is known to enter at three loops, and it's, it it arises because when you're doing these quantum field theory loops, you split it between soft and potential modes. Right. But that distinction becomes basically artificial at sufficiently high loop, and the way it shows up is you get a three loop diagram that has an IR divergence that can't be canceled. And what it means is that you have to add another layer of the EFT where you have radiation modes to cancel that. And this was all done by the EFT, IRA and company. So uh, I could point to the reference, but I think okay. it's been at least systematically understood in the EFT. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Sure. Good, we're having a lot of discussion. I think we will take one last question and then move on to the next talk. So last question is to uh, Enrico, or you took away your raised hand? Sorry. I think I just wanted to make one comment to this, I, I, similar to what Cliff already said. I think, uh, Cliff, is it true that they figured all that out in the gravity setting? I know it's been, a lot of work has been done in NRQCD, which is very similar with all the things you said with the non-local potential and stuff. Yes, it's been worked out entirely for the full 4PN uh, dynamics. So they took both effective field theories in the far zone and the near zone and added them and found that all these spurious singularities cancel. Uh, it has to do with zero bend subtraction. It's all ported, I think, from the usual uh, NRGR, uh, NRQCD type literature. But I think can, it's, can it's I relatively systematic. Yeah. Can you hear me? We hear you, yes. Can you guys hear me? Hi, uh, Cliff. You're talking about my work, right? This is, but I think I, yeah, Rafael. Rafael yeah. I sent you, you a message. Talk. Sorry, I cannot talk very much because my family is around. That's why I haven't spoken. We can do the impetus with radiation reaction. We can implement exactly what you said that we have done with NRGR to do the same with PM. Uh, we have done it uh, following similar ideas to what Donald did, exactly what Nima said. And we did this in our first paper where we set up the impetus formula. And then we derived it also doing what Emil described with the iterations and this different representation and showing that it's just directly the amplitude in these other bases that you know very well. So yes, I think we know how to do this. We haven't done it yet. But I think we know how to include the radiation reaction into impetus to include this to higher orders. And I don't think it will be an infrared problem because in PM, these infrared divergences should cancel by themselves. We see these mm -hmm. infrared divergences because we split into regions, as you just said. But mm -hmm. if we can really do the relativistic integration exactly, 
then this should be infinite. It fine. should just cancel. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. so that's, that's excellent. Do, do, can you also see hereditary effects? The what? Can you add the hereditary, hereditary effects? Effect? Absolutely. You should see the conservative oh, cool. effect coming out exactly awesome. where, from the onshell poles. The real part of the onshell poles should give you the, the hereditary effects. So we compute it with IRA through the zero bin. It should come out here automatically. Very cool. Is that that's not is that out yet or is that no 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 coming? no? This is something that is uh, it's we are doing the conservative part right now. We want to okay perfect potentials. Great. I look forward to seeing it. Subsequent work. Great. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for not showing my face. It's just it's a mess here. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, and uh, it's great to have all the discussion. But I think we have to stop at some point. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is the good point to stop. And we thank Emil again.